Welcome to the Frontiers of Brain Health Lecture Series. Uh, happy Friday, uh, and thank you for joining us. Um, we at the Center for Brain Health are striving to be leaders in exploring the brain at a basic and fundamental level. We're also committed to translating research into innovations that benefit the most possible people. And our mission is to understand, protect, and restore the brain. And that cuts across many different um, types of individuals and populations. Today's topic is really going to be a brain meets society sort of issue. Really it's veterans mental health in general and veterans health and specifically conquering or trying to deal with the problem of homelessness. And so this is one of those major societal challenges which we're frankly not doing nearly enough about and we're not hearing enough about it. So uh, this is near and dear to a lot of us at the Center for Brain Health. We have uh, within our DNA, a lot of interest in veterans related healthcare and mental health care. We've uh, attacked this both at a uh, research level and at a translational level. So today we're gonna hear from Dr. Dina Hushyar, who is the director of the National Center on Homelessness Among Veterans, the NCHAV, which is part of the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs. Dina has an amazing background for this uh, mental health challenge and physical health challenge. This cuts across psychiatry, neurology, and rehab medicine, and she has a background that reflects that. She has an MD from UT Medical Branch in Galveston. She did a residency in internal medicine at the University of Iowa, and also a residency in psychiatry at Yale before going on to have a uh, master's degree in public health from the University of North Carolina. So she covers a lot of different important areas within um, healthcare and uh, broadly mental health care um, and targeted specifically at the veteran population. She's also an associate professor at UT Southwestern and is formerly a, the medical director of the VA North Texas Healthcare System, which he's still very active with here in Dallas. So uh, we are going to uh, look forward to this important presentation on a really critical and timely topic by Dina Hushyar. Um, I, the way we'll proceed is she will give her presentation and then we will hold questions until the end. And I will moderate a question period to wrap us up and we look forward to this uh, really timely and critical presentation. Uh, welcome, Dina. Thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you for the wonderful introduction and also thank you for the promotion. So as a clarification, I was the medical director for um, Dallas VA's uh, comprehensive medical center programs there. I'm super excited to be with everybody um, and y'all's way of introducing with everybody in the audience virtually who's very um, reminiscent of our good old times. All right. Um, so again, thanks for having me. Um, and I'm going to be talking about homelessness in the veteran population. And from the perspective of where I'm coming from, which is the VA's National Center on Homelessness Among Veterans. So I'm going to talk specifically about how we've contributed to this um, societal issue. And so let's start from the beginning, which is the history of the center. Back in 2009, the VA Secretary Eric Sinchiki, he announced his five-year um, goal of ending homelessness among veterans. Um, later on, he said that this was a lofty goal and he said the five years just to get everybody motivated, which was actually quite great because a lot of resources were utilized to um, combat homelessness. One of them was to create what we now call the National Center on Homelessness Among Veterans. Um, so he announced that the center would be created to fight the uh, to achieve the goal of ending homelessness in 2009 and then 2010, it was operationalized. It has four major core components. One of them is the policy analysis program integration. The other is model development and implementation. The other is education and dissemination. The other is research and methodology. Our population that we aim to serve are veterans experiencing homelessness and also veterans at risk of housing instability and their dependents. Um, we're under the Homeless Programs Office at uh, Veterans Health Administration. And our goal is obviously stable housing, but to take it a step further, which is to promote uh, recovery oriented care to support independent and self-sufficient living in the community of the veterans choosing. Uh, so as we're progressing in the history of the center in 2011, in order to further uh, 
support our uh, research and education and model development activities, we then, uh, the center then affiliated with uh, some academic institutions, which were the University of Pennsylvania, South Florida, and Massachusetts. Um, the other interesting thing and unique thing about the center is that it was codified into public law, um, uh, the 114-315 section 713 of the Jeff Miller, Richard Blumenthal Veterans Healthcare and Benefits Improvement Act. Um, and it basically has our mandated functions, which are basically what we were doing before um, that we had our uh, public law. And these are to conduct and support research, assess the effectiveness of homeless programs, identify and disseminate best practices and integrate these practices into policies, programs, and services for veterans experiencing homelessness or at risk of homelessness and serve as a resource center for research and training activities. Um, and this is the one of the unique things about the center is not only for the department, which means VA and VA is con comprised of Veterans Benefits and Veterans Health Administration and the Cemetery Division, and also other federal and non-federal entities. Um, and that's one of the main uh, things that I'm hoping that you all will take away from this uh, discussion is that when you have questions about veteran homelessness or at risk of homelessness, and you have an idea about research or model development or education, to remember myself and, and our colleagues at the center so that hopefully uh, we can be able to collaborate on uh, an endeavor. And so talking about some things that the center has done in the past that are fundamental to how we're able to approach veteran homelessness now, and we actually take for granted, but they didn't exist before the center created them. One of them is called the Homeless Registry, and it is a data set of sorts of veterans who are engaged in VA care who have been identified as being homeless. And so this information comes from the electronic medical records at the VA, it's called CPRS, and also from Veterans Benefits, which does not utilize CPRS, they have their own data system. And then there's another data system called HOMES that um, clinicians uh, who take care of veterans um, experiencing homelessness in the homeless programs, they put information in that. So it has a robust um, information about veterans who are experiencing homelessness. Uh, the caveat is that it is of veterans who are mainly um, engaged with VA care. Um, the other thing that was um, instrumental is to get a better understanding of homelessness as it impacts veterans. You can't do something about a problem in the sense of wanting to fix something until you can identify that problem. Um, so every year HUD presents to Congress this annual homeless assessment report. And in 2009, when this uh, center was uh, thought of and then created subsequently, Congress did not have a specific se section for veteran homelessness, like it has a specific section for chronic homelessness or uh, youth or families. Um, so the center created this information to present to HUD to include it uh, for Congress. Um, and then that actually then nowadays that's something that you just see and that started uh, happening in 2011. Um, and going along with that idea of you need to identify what's going on to be able to address it, um, the VA, um, uh, like other institutions, we have uh, benchmarks that we uh, would like to achieve and to help clinicians get those benchmarks, achieve those benchmarks, we have something called a clinical reminder. Um, and so these clinical reminders are, can be about asking patients that clinicians sees about, um, you know, colon cancer screening or breast cancer screening or uh, tobacco, PTSD, um, suicidality. Um, and recently in the last five or six years, there's a homeless screening. So every uh, veteran who engages care at the VA asks, gets asked the question by any outpatient clinician, um, are you currently homeless or are you at risk of homelessness and either positive response if the veteran chooses would be um, a referral to a specific homeless uh, uh, clinician who could help the veteran at that time to uh, secure more stable housing. And then these other ones are programs um, that again are bread and butter for us now, but when we started off, um, they didn't exist. Uh, back in 2009. Um, so one of them is called Supportive Services for Veterans Families. Um, the VA um, um, has a call out for grantees to 
uh, apply, and then the VA funds these grantees, and then these grantees would then be able to help veterans and their families who are unstably housed. Um, and for example, if they're in apartments and they won't be able to make their rent, um, and if they don't make their rent, they have no other place to go besides the streets or shelters, then SSVF can be able to help. So it's a preventative um, mechanism to um, combat homelessness. Um, the way that uh, the next program is the Homeless Patient Aligned Care Teams. So the way that the VA has its medical care is something called the Patient Aligned Care Team, uh, meaning that there's a, a prescriber and a social worker and a, a nurse and a um, admin staff, all the same, all working together and you're not having various different people, staff in and out, taking care of the same um, patients. So the, the patient sees the same people um, and so has continuity of care. And part of the concept with the homeless packs is to try to see from the veterans experiencing homelessness what would be more beneficial for them. So unlike the non-homeless packs, um, there's more walk-in availability and also more importantly, the people from the homeless pack will go to the streets um, into the community to provide care there. Um, the next program is the Community Resource and Referral Center. And this is basically a one-stop shop to have a non-medical feel for that interaction so people are put at ease. Um, so the non-medical feel would be like helping with housing, helping there be laundry mats at this place or a computer place uh, availability. Um, and sometimes there's an HPAC um, there too. So it's more of like wraparound services, engagement, and then hope and would also provide medical and other care um, as the veteran is open to it. And safe havens, those are contracts uh, that um, community providers can apply for. And it's meant for a population that has multiple needs because this population uh, have serious mental illness and substance use uh, disorders. Um, so housing first demonstration project. So uh, back in 2009, 2010, um, the way that veterans would um, be eligible for housing would be something called that they're uh, housing ready, meaning that they demonstrated that they're engaged in care, um, some uh, or have if they have substance use disorder, they have negative urine drug screens, and then once they're at that point, then the discussion comes to, okay, now we have a HUD bash voucher, HUD provides the voucher, uh, and VA supportive housing provides permanent, uh, permanent supportive care in terms of care management, um, and they would get the um, long-term housing once that they demonstrated that they've done these specific things. Housing First philosophy says, well, it's very challenging to be able to attend all your appointments, to be able to have a negative drug screen if you're um, a person who has a substance use disorder, if you're worried about where you're living. Um, so why don't we provide housing, stable long-term housing, not just uh, transitional housing, at the same time that we're also providing care. So it's not that you demonstrate something in terms of making milestones and then you get housing, but rather at the same time. And now that this has become um, a, the foundational way that we go about providing housing. Um, and so who are we at the center? Um, we are uh, consist of 15 people. For time's sake, I'll just talk about the, the leadership at the center. Um, and so Roger Casey, he's the director for our education and dissemination core. He is a founding member of the center. Uh, Dr. Jack Sai, um, he's uh, the research director and well-known in homeless research. And so this is a research core staff. Um, there's Jack and Eric. Um, he's also well-known in financial literacy and how that impacts um, suicidality and homelessness. Um, and then Dorota, um, she does a lot of work on um, utilization of care, whether or not that's healthcare or housing, um, and, and how that is different in the homeless versus not homeless. Um, and we also, we're, so we're a national center, meaning that we're a VA central office, uh, even though we're not all living in at DC. And then we have local affiliates at the VAs and um, we have 38 of those affiliates. And these are researchers who are interested in working uh, in the homeless population or the justice involved population. So it's um, kind of like a think tank of having like-minded researchers. Um, and the um, person at the Dallas VA who's our uh, affiliate 
is Dr. LePage, and he is the ACOS, uh, the director for the uh, research and development um, service at the Dallas VA. And the vision for the research arm of the center um, consists of multiple things, but we're showing three of them here. One is to expand our research portfolio and um, outreach. And so that's why I'm really excited that I'm had the opportunity to talk with you all to kind of think about new ideas and taking those new ideas and seeing if they work. Um, the other is to develop interventions and new knowledge. Um, one of our passions here is to try to think about it from a preventative point of view. So right now we have great programs for um, once people are literally homeless or as we talked about SSVF, once they're teetering on homelessness, but wouldn't it be wonderful if people wouldn't even have to be at that stage that we can kind of detect if somebody's going to be having some problems and um, so that we can provide wraparound services at that time. And for the VA, unlike the community, we know who our population is going to be for um, homelessness. Like in the community, it can be people coming out of foster uh, care or people coming out of jail. So there's a different venues that folks are coming in to homelessness in the community. But at the VA, it's basically if you have served in the military um, or you were a reservist and were activated. Um, so those, that's our population. So we're right now actively trying to work with DOD um, to see how can we look at indicators while the service member, not yet a veteran, is in DOD so that we can um, provide them more wraparound services um, so that they don't have to go through um, becoming housing instability once they're a veteran. Um, and the other is to try to, in terms of vision, to uh, seek and support external grant fundings or, um, uh, or and through community partnerships and other public interests. And our research priorities are fourfold, um, one, and there are big chunks here. So physical and mental health, um, and the health of a person really drives um, people becoming homeless. And also once a person is homeless, their health uh, deteriorates. Um, so there's that um, interaction that we're trying to help to prevent and end homelessness. Uh, functioning and flourishing is, I think, something that resonates with you all quite well, is how can we look into preventative things. Uh, program evaluation is we have these um, bread and butter kind of programs, how are they doing um, to meet the needs and is there anything new and exciting that we should be doing um, given our evaluation of these programs. Population-based uh, studies are um, looking at the epidemiology of, of various populations, for example, geriatrics uh, uh, or veterans who are experiencing homelessness who are older or have HIV, uh, kind of thinking about it on the global picture, bigger picture, so that we can then inform our program evaluations and other projects. And talking about a being a source of grant funding, so we are very fortunate to, our center is not that big, but we have some money. Um, and so this year we were very fortunate to fund five uh, intramural grants. Um, they're, um, they, one is able to apply for these grants if you're one of our 38 affiliates. And as you're looking at these uh, titles of these grants, you can see that the COVID-19 and its impact on our health and well-being and just life in general is reflected on what um, folks are going to be doing, looking at. So some folks are looking at uh, how to have resource guides in this virtual era where having access to virtual technology might not, that, might not be that convenient uh, for some veterans experiencing homelessness. Um, and how do you use a VA Video Connect? So now that there's less face-to-face -face interactions, um, VA uh, has more virtual technology. So how do you do that with uh, populations that are experiencing homelessness? And a caveat to that. So um, when I say populations experiencing homelessness, there's it's a mixed group. So there's veterans who are living on the streets, there's veterans living in the shelter, and there's veterans living in um, their own apartments through HUD bash um, uh, vouchers. And so th that veteran population of HUD bash is not necessarily what we think of as homeless, but they're in a homeless program. Um, and then the other um, intramural grant is thinking about how do you go about preparing for other epidemics in the um, homeless population um, and also, how do you 
look at the experience of healthcare, specifically primary healthcare, primary care uh, for veterans who are experiencing homelessness in this COVID-19 um, environment. And one of our, the fifth one isn't necessarily specifically about COVID-19 or telehealth, but rather looking at various factors um, that influence suicidality among homeless and just justice involved veterans. And by justice involved veterans, and, and that means veterans who have had um, prison, um, jail uh, kind of histories. Um, and one, another program that's very dear and near to our hearts, and that's a new program that we're really excited to roll out and it's being rolled out now, is that we uh, have created a fellowship um, for people who, clinicians and non-clinicians, who are interested in learning more about homelessness and having a career in homelessness. And there's five pilot sites um, at uh, five different uh, VAs. Uh, and there's one, so there's Bronx, Dallas, Los Angeles, Palo Alto, and West Haven. Um, and we've partnered, the center has partnered with VA Office of Academic Affiliations to guide us into this process. And the great thing about this fellowship program is that that fellow will have resources at the center, and they will also have their local mentor resources at one of these five sites. The other thing that we've also uh, started is, and I say we started because uh, Jack Sai, he's relatively uh, new to the center and he's the director for the uh, center's research. Um, and he started in January of 2019 and I'm relatively new to the center um, and I started in March of 2019. Um, so we've created the Homeless Veterans Research Engagement Panel. It's very important for us uh, to be able to get the voice of the veteran in when we're talking about uh, potential research projects, or once we have these research projects, what do these findings really mean? And then once we have that, how do you go about disseminating this information um, to clinicians and, and veterans who are utilizing the services? Um, so this panel meets quarterly and it's uh, run by two of our research affiliates. And this is a picture of our, of our education core staff. Um, so Roger Casey, as I said, he was one of the um, founders of the center. Sabrina and Derek um, help with the educational aspects that we do. And we have multiple webinars and other things um, and provide technical assistance. Um, so in terms of education and dissemination, we provide education and consultation uh, so that we're wanting to improve delivery of services. And we want to also obtain uniform standards of care across the nation. It's interesting to be uh, provider, uh, a national provider, and so it helps to have somebody nationally to be able to navigate things for uh, different people, um, and we provide best practices, program development, and other learning opportunities. We also want to disseminate um, the knowledge that we've gained uh, through our research and model development, and our education arm does that and provides this uh, education to VA and other federal agencies and community organizations who are serving veterans experiencing homelessness. And we also design and develop methods that can best serve and meet the needs of diverse groups uh, and organizations. Um, so when we're thinking about how we go about thinking about educating, this is the process that we use. Um, so every two years, we have a, something called a knowledge survey. Uh, it's a needs assessment. We send out the survey to um, clinicians uh, who are providing care to veterans experiencing homelessness at the VA. And then we analyze this. We um, do a gap analysis to say, hey, this is our curriculum but um, from last year, but this is what people are saying that they really need. And then we try to transfer learning to people through creating a curriculum and educational plan that meets this knowledge gap. Um, and then we evaluate this um, curriculum because after each webinar, there's this evaluation and we continuously look at these evaluations. And then we create a annual report to say, hey, this is what we did. This is where we want to go and um, go from there. And what came out of one of uh, this process is um, something that is, I think really great is called the competency model. And this is a, a learning platform that we don't think 
that is not aimed at a specific um, specialty. So it's not for physicians, it's not for social workers, not for peer support specialists or occupational therapists, but rather, or administrators, um, but rather it's for people who are uh, taking care of the homeless population. So in our mind, these are some core things that folks uh, should know about um, regardless of what specialty so that they're in a sense have the knowledge to do what they need to do. Um, and um, so there are seven domains. Uh, one of the instances is that VA perspective, systems of VA care. The other domain is homeless populations. The other domain is homeless programming, interventions and design policy. The other domain is about partnerships. And the fifth domain is program evaluation, research policy and prior research. The sixth domain is about homeless cultural competency. And the seventh domain is about homelessness and professionalism and ethical practice. And I'm sure everybody's wondering, well, how do I get access to all this lovely learning? Um, so if you're a VA employee, you can go to uh, Talent Management System, which is, um, if you're a VA employee, you know what that is. Um, so it's basically a software program that has all the mandatory learning opportunities and some, and also electives. And this will be an elective and you would just put the homeless competency um, in a search, and then you'll be able to find it. If uh, you're not a VA employee, you can go to our website, the center's website, you can just Google National Center on Homelessness and Veterans, and then go into the education tab, and then you will see the competency model there. And I hope you uh, enjoy it. Um, and so, and if you're wondering how, how we created the competency, uh, curriculum and it, a lot of effort went into it. So we collaborated with other homeless programs office. We collaborated with the VA's employee education system, the homeless program office where the center leads this has a homeless learning advisory council that's made out of various uh, people from within the homeless programs and outside that we talk about what are the needs and um, how to meet them. And then we also talk to other subject matter experts and we also talk to uh, supervisors at various VAs around the country. And then we piloted this competency model at seven pilot sites for around six months and we tweaked it and then it was created. Um, and switching to another core element that the center does is model development. So again, Roger Casey, he leads that and Nora, um, she, uh, she helps with the model development activities and Michael was, well said he's a psychiatrist and he's our medical advisor that helps to think about what's the next newest greatest thing and how to um, create it and disseminate it. Um, so when we're talking about model development and implementation, we're developing services to meet uh, community and VA needs because again, the center's not just as a per our public law, we're not just for the VA, but also for the community, addressing special populations, enhancing access, filling gaps. We also evaluate programs uh, and determine program design functions and fidelity. We try to provide opportunity to review existing policies and regulations of opportunities to review practice and form services, to be able to adapt them to other programs opportunities to contribute to the knowledge base and the literature about homelessness, mental health, substance abuse, and special populations. Um, uh, and Roger Casey created um, these, uh, this way of thinking, um, and um, it talks about how do you go about actually developing something new? Um, so the thought is you synthesize, and then you translate this information into some sort of design, and then you deliver it, and then you have to, which um, the older I'm getting, the um, more I find that this is important, provide the support and technical assistance to maintain it. Oftentimes there's a lot of energy to create something and implement it. Uh, that same energy in terms of sustainability and tweaking it also needs to be there. Uh, so the next slide talks a little bit more about the specifics of it. So in terms of synthesis, you have the inquiry, um, Part. You start off with saying, okay, what's the research out there? What's the current practices? You know, what is the cost benefit analysis? I might have this great idea, but if it requires a gazillion dollars and I don't have a gazillion dollars, um, is now the right time to go for it? Uh, what other offerings are there? And needs assessment, so it's just not just you, but other, it's being supported by other folks. Um, and what are the technical manuals out there that you can learn from? And what is the authorities for provision in terms of laws 
uh, out there. And then once you do all that, you then translate that into creating a model which has uh, program components, site requirements, um, adjustments of these programs, funding requirements, operational requirements, maybe even some training requirements, uh, the development that you've done and you've now kind of refined that model. I mean, then, then you deliver it to your sites to see about sustainability, about stakeholder buy-in, about providing contracts, about how to operationalize it and getting staff and site training. And then you bring in the support aspect, which is the technical assistance and start off with bi-weekly admin support, uh, provider support, um, provide support also for the administration staff who are not uh, the clinicians, but are the backbone of the program, um, kind of review things and then also look for data to see how you can tweak it. Um, and then hopefully all the stuff will then result into a best practice. And then you would then take this back best practice and then inform policy and then you would be able to disseminate it not just at your pilot sites but like for example the housing first started off in 14 pilot sites or so and now it's something nationally. Um, so now we're just going to talk about uh, central models and the way that we conceptualize it are things that are transitioned meaning that we created which I've uh, some of this might be uh, uh, that I've talked about in the past and now they're um, bread and butter and people think that they've always been there in a sense. Um, and then the other group is transitioning. So we've created and they're about to graduate, um, but they haven't left home yet. Um, and then the current one is that they're, they're pretty solid, but they're not um, at all ready to go leave home. And advancing those are, are um, the apples in our eyes that we're trying to think about the future and see how best to try to uh, take the next step forward. So the transition one is uh, fundamental ones are the housing first, which I uh, talked about uh, in the initial slide in the community resource and referral center, which are again, the drop-in ones. So um, the housing first started off with 14 initial sites and now they're, as I said, a national philosophy and the community resource center, they didn't, that idea did not exist and now it's at 31. Um, BAs. The other transition ones, meaning that their solid programs are the safe haven, um, and now they're in 21 sites, the PAC teams, 55 BAs have them. And so transitioning, meaning that we've done a lot of work and we're pretty confident um, that they're going to be graduating shortly. Um, and so GPD, that's grant and per diem. So again, the BA uh, gives out uh, monies to grantees who have applied to these programs um, and these pro and GPD is a transitional housing so that the VA funds the community partner to provide transitional care um, generally in shelters. Um, and then they also provide the care management and the food and other things. And the concept is low demand. And uh, sometimes people look at low demand and they think oh, it's not very wanted, but rather it's flipped, meaning low demand, meaning that this is for a population of veterans who have a lot of complex needs. Um, and so therefore there's not gonna be that much um, demand on them to do uh, things, but rather to work at, with them at where they are at. And so there, this um, transitioning um, model development activity is now at 80 sites. Um, and then the current ones, we're really um, excited about these. Um, and the thought behind this is that um, when the, when people, when clinicians who are working in the homeless programs are working with veterans, it would be great if that interaction could also, in addition to care management and supportive therapy, could also have um, elements of um, some uh, psychotherapy. Um, so we were able, the center was able to um, collaborate with the Beck Institute um, and they created a specific home uh, cognitive behavioral therapy CBT for homeless population. And through the Beck Institute, they uh, were able to educate around 30 homeless staff and uh, to do CBT uh, for a homeless population. And um, our prelim findings that we just start, we just ended the, the round with them. Uh, training the uh, clinicians and homeless staff uh, a couple of months ago, but the initial findings showed that they, the veterans who got CBT um, were able to have decrease in their depression 
and increase in other um, wellness markers, which is great because this shows that sometimes um, folks are uncertain whether or not folks will be, uh, veterans will be um, attending various sessions, but they were able to maintain attendance. The other um, modality that we want to specifically educate, further educate um, the homeless service providers is motivational interviewing. Um, so the VA has a lot of um, educational opportunities uh, through the VA's National Evidence-Based Psychotherapy Program in the Office of Mental Health and Suicide Prevention. So we were able to uh, collaborate with them for them to uh, train um, homeless service providers about um, motivational inter interviewing so that they can talk specifically more about substance use and suicide and how to go about improving one's daily life. And again, like the CBT model, the MI model had uh, good results too. Um, so advancing means that these are ideas um, and we're hoping that we can get some traction and we're, we're get, we have some traction, um, but they're not as far along as the other ones. Uh, so we have this another program in Homeless Programs Office, which is the Veterans Justice Program. And the, the thought is, how can we use video on demand to increase the availability of uh, courts to the veterans who are in this program? Um, and so we've now done a thorough assessment of what is used, what currently um, Veterans Justice Programs are using in terms of um, virtual care. And so now the next point, next step is to now talk with Veterans Justice Program to figure out what the next step is so that they can advance um, telecare in the court system. Um, and then the other one is uh, veterans diagnosed with serious mental illness who are participating in the HUD-BASH program. So again, HUD provides Section 8 vouchers and BASH, which is VA, another uh, supportive housing, which is another program under the Homeless Programs Office. They provide care management. Um, and this has uh, been a really fun um, adventure, actually. So we have partnered with VA's uh, Office of Mental Health Suicide Prevention and Primary Care and homeless programs. Um, and we've created, in a sense, um, a database of veterans who are participating in hud -BASH, who have a serious mental illness and included various elements in this database that primary care usually looks at, that mental health usually looks at, and um, homeless housing services looks at, but all in one data, uh, data uh, dashboard. And so the next step is to then pilot it at different sites to say, okay, now you have all this information conveniently for you. How are you going to best use it so that you can provide holistic care to this highly vulnerable population um, because all of these veterans um, have some sort of psychosis? So I'll tell you um, in the future how this ends. And I'm just going to leave you all with my email and our center website. Um, and this is how the center website looks like. And I would encourage you all to click on our resource center. Um, and it has a lot of information uh, that are related to homelessness, um, has uh, uh, publications, has handouts, has uh, all different kind of good stuff. And it's uh, relatively, it went up around a month ago. So if you've been to our website before, this is something new. And then our website has um, specific questions. Um, if you're wanting to give us a formal question under the research model, uh, research, if, if you want, uh, if you have a question about research models, if you have a question about model development and also education, if there's any specific needs. Um, so again, thank you for this opportunity. And then I look forward to having further discussions with you all. Okay, thank you, Dina, for all the great information and um, the uh, overview of all of the steps that go into this. Um, our first question for you is related to that uh, process of how um, a veteran enters that, that, that uh, system or, or knows about these opportunities. Um, specifically, how are the majority of vets contacted initially? Is there a way to contact um, as they're discharged from the service that they've been in? Um, or the worry is that the, do you have to wait until they're actually in trouble before they enter into these opportunities? Thank you for that question. Um, so it's gonna be a, a long answer because there's uh, no wrong door in a sense. So in terms of when the veteran is still a service member, I've actually been quite, a, since this is something that we're really working and in, looking into um, in the last uh, two years or so, it's, uh, 
DOD has done a lot of uh, new and exciting things. Um, so one thing is called the, the TAP program, Transition Assistance Program. They've always had the TAP program, um, but they've really ramped it up. Um, and I'm not from DOD, but from my uh, experience with talking to them um, in the last uh, year or so. And so what happens in the TAP program, every uh, service member from the general all the way down, they're required to take a three-day um, classes basically, and they talk about transition, employment, and other things. And if there's a, another extra two days of additional information. And part of that TAP program, you also they also get um, a counselor. So the counselor will go through various things, including housing. And if they have difficulty with housing, um, and they begin this transitional process a year prior to discharge from the military. Um, and so if they have difficulty with housing, then they will connect uh, that service member at that time to VHA's transition care team. Um, so you have that process in the DOD. And then the DOD also has something called the in-transition team. And so again, a year prior to uh, service members leaving the DOD, if that service member has had um, a diagnosis of a mental health or substance use disorder, or have been hospitalized in a mental health unit, then the in-service um, coaches from the DOD will reach out to the in, uh, transition service members and say, hey, we've noticed that you're transitioning out. Do you, do you want help with establishing care at the VA or other places? And if so, then um, those coaches will um, do a warm handoff with VHA's um, transition team. Um, so the in-transition service um, coaches, this is a voluntary activity the service members could say no, and also um, service members who do not have a mental health or substance use diagnosis can also ask to be helped with. Um, so you have those proactive things going on in the DOD, which again, are not part of the DOD, but I do not think they existed in this level until recently. Um, so VA is uh, VHA, which is I'm from Veterans Health Administration and VBA, which is the benefits side. VBA has also been doing some really wonderful things too um, recently. So they have something called the Solid Start Program. Um, so what they are doing is that they're calling all veterans um, who have uh, discharged from the military within their first year of discharge from the military. And um, don't quote me, but I think they call them at one month then like six months and then 12 months. And what they do is they say, hey, do you remember your TAP education, uh, your transition uh, assistance program? Because you have benefits from the VA, but they will expire. And I, I'm not a benefits person, so I don't know exactly what all these benefits are in their expiration dates, but they will expire by whatever date. So let's, ha let's help you if you want to get services from the VA, we can help you with that. Um, so, and then the VA, we're going to be, VHA, sorry, we're going to be starting soon something called the VHA um, Connoisseur uh, Project, which we will also be um, call, contacting the service member within a month out. So there's all this active um, people from both DOD, um, VBA, and VHA. So the VHA, we have um, the transition team which is stationed, um, so there's many military bases. There's also military bases outside of the United States. Um, we don't have any mil, uh, VHAs people outside of the United States. The majority of um, service members who are transitioning out of the military, they generally come home to the United States to transition out. Um, so we have um, VHA transition team members at the military uh, bases so that they can help with um, proactively finding um, service members who are transitioning out. So in the ideal world, uh, if all the, the ducks line up, we should have warm handoffs for everybody who has um, any difficulty with housing upon a discharge from housing. The reality is that if somebody does something um, not right, and, uh, and then they're going to be uh, discharged rather quickly from the military. So, for example, if you if somebody has all this, um, one of uh, some some does something illegal, basically having uh, drugs on their possession, they're going to get discharged or something like that. So then, all those safety measures might not have enough time 
to be able to um, and be enacted. But if, if things are going the way that they're supposed to be going, then the, the transition process has much improved uh, as compared to 2010. The other thing is that um, looking at literature um, or research is that uh, generally people, when they're transitioning out, they have enough social supports, enough monies uh, to last them for a year, two years. But then challenges in terms of reintegration back into society, um, it becomes more noticeable around like five to 10 years. Um, so primary prevention, it is great that we really actively work with um, the military so that we can catch those who might not have anything when they discharge from the military. Um, the reality is that they folks might be going and saying, yeah, I have a girlfriend, boyfriend that I'm gonna be staying with. Um, so they would be okay for a couple of months, but then what happens when they're not um, having that good relationship? Um, and so that's where um, the VA has this. Um, so we have a, a hotline uh, that um, uh, the veteran themselves or the family members that themselves can call. And it's a homeless call center line. And it's a national line It works 24 uh, seven. You get the information to a national representative. That information is then given to, um, through our CPRS, through our medical records, uh, to our local facility, VA facility where the veterans working. So uh, living, sorry, so that the local facility can reach out we also have um, outreach staff that go uh, um, to the streets and look for folks who are veterans who are experiencing homelessness. Granted right now that outreach work is a little uh, challenging given COVID-19. Um, all our medical facilities have a homeless coordinator associated with it. Um, and so the uh, people in the ER or social work or primary care know who to contact. Um, so there is a lot of um, information out there uh, for the facilities to be able to direct and we all have websites that people can go to, but this is another reason that, you know, I'm glad that you all extended this invite to me because it's always important for more people to know. So um, hopefully if you um, have this information and you come across a veteran who's experiencing homelessness, there's the, I uh, just Google the homeless, uh, National Homeless Call Center and you'll be able to talk with anybody anytime about care. Okay, so a uh, question from the chat. This is related, I think, to the sort of cultural transition that has to happen for individuals. Um, do programs um, that veterans attend emulate military training, or do you take more of a civilian approach or a mix of both? And it's really related to how these programs help transition former military to civilian life. So I can speak of the programs that uh, VHA offers in the transition. Um, so I would say it's a mix of both um, because at the end of the day, uh, the folks who are veterans are no longer in, in the military. They need to figure out how to go about working, living, being in the civilian world. And it is very challenging. I mean, if, if you go from a structure that they tell you like, where to be at what time. Um, when I was uh, doing a research project, uh, talking with veterans who had experienced homelessness and I asked them, you know, what could have helped you not be homeless? Um, they, they universally said that the military, you know, gave me uh, survival skills, but what I need is life skills. And in the same context, they were saying that when I went into the military, my own identity was taken away. Um, so my hair was shaved. Um, I, so you go from that kind of mentality and that structure to not having that, it becomes very challenging. So the good thing about, um, from my point of view, uh, by coming to get care at the VA, uh, the VA um, actually is the largest uh, employer of veterans. So I believe it's around one third of all um, people, uh, workers at the VA have worked in the military. And so you have that understanding Kind of from the get-go in terms of military culture so that if some uh, clinician or worker at the VA is not a military person, um, have a military background, um, they have that uh, resource for them. And obviously our TMS and other things, we talk about military culture. Um, so there's an there's understanding of what it is to have led that life 
And then so we're able to uh, acknowledge it and know what it means or feels like. And at the same time saying, if, if the veteran's goal is to transition to a non-military civilian life, um, this is how these are steps to be needed to be taken. The great, the other thing is that um, during like these group therapies for various things, um, there's obviously, you know, the work that gets done within the group, but then um, sometimes the veterans themselves then have uh, work groups that have, they're not work groups, but they then work outside of the group with each other. So um, you have a mixture of both. A couple of questions that sort of get at the same uh, issue of outcomes. Um, first, what, what is the success rate of veterans who have transitioned from homelessness to independent living? And I think just related to that, um, can you indicate maybe any um, features or leading indicators that would help us to better predict um, any, any one individual's success? Um, if you have uh, anything you would wanna say there. Yeah, um, that's a great question. So actually that's something that we are trying to do now. So um, we're working with um, our uh, HUD BASH, which is another program in Homeless Programs Office. And we're um, talking to them about how to go about doing predictive analysis, um, trying to figure out what are the elements that would make it um, more likely or less likely somebody has a successful outcome. Um, so the, the thing about um, HUD BASH is that they provide, uh, HUD provides the voucher um, and then um, VA provides the care management. Uh, so some veterans are in HUD BASH for a very long time. And then some veterans um, graduate out um, either because they make more than the amount of money that HUD, HUD will supply the vouchers, which off the top of my head is around $25,000 uh, for a single person, non-family um, veteran without any family, or they um, um, don't need the case management because they're now been able to live independently about it without any case management. And so that's exactly the questions that we're having is like, is there a way that we can uh, predict to see what is, what is, who is more likely than not to be able to be able to successfully exit out of HUD bash? And if, if that's the case, then for those who are not as likely, is there like wraparound services that we can, provide. So right now, there isn't any like uh, solid numbers that I could uh, quote from you. Um, there's more information about what are predictors of homelessness rather than what are predictors of successes. Um, and that's another research project that we're doing at the center. Um, we've been able to identify um, 11 veterans who were homeless and now are successful. And we've done um, interviews with them. So now we're going to do qualitative and hopefully quantitative analysis of that and get more veterans. So more to come. Excellent. Uh, another question from the chat, maybe related to what you had just talked about. So one of the things that uh, we could consider are not just the individual himself, but who, who their, whom their social support network is, which is going to be critical. Um, a question about how you um, clarify or communicate the resources to spouses of military veterans um, who don't necessarily uh, receive communications maybe from the uh, coordinators or directors or possibly other caregiver uh, family members who might be helpful um, either for for uh, mental health related challenges or homelessness specifically. Yeah, so as a clinician myself, that's challenging because if um, if the veteran tells you, I don't want anybody else to know that I have a mental health problem or I'm homeless, um, and the veteran has a capacity to say that, uh, meaning that they're not a harm to themselves or, the, or anybody else, um, then we got to go with what the veteran uh, wants. And, um, and hopefully we can encourage people, veterans, to be able to expand their social networks um, and go from there. Um, one of the litmus tests I had when I was uh, seeing veterans at the Dallas VA to see whether or not the therapy that they were engaged in is going well with me is that generally veterans um, have a phone. Uh, sometimes they run out of minutes, but they would uh, get a call in during session and they would just, uh, just say, I'm busy. They would answer the phone and say, I'm busy. And they would hang up. And then as 
uh, session uh, therapy progressed, they would answer it, say, I'm at the VA and hang up. And then as progression happens in therapy, then they would say, I'm at the VA seeing my physician and hang up. And very few got to this point. I'm at the VA seeing my psychiatrist. As soon as they said that, I knew regardless of what's going on, their life trajectory is way better than the veteran who A, isn't getting any phone calls uh, or B, is just saying that I'm at the VA. Um, so it is, there's, it, it's a challenge to provide information to family members if the veteran themselves does not want that information given to family members. It's just like if you're going to see your primary care doctor and you don't want um, your spouse or whoever to know about what's going on. Um, but if the question is, um, you know, the veteran wants the family members to know, it just how do they go about uh, accessing this information? So again, there's a lot of information online and I granted if you, uh, at the VA websites, um, that's one source. The other is I would encourage the family members to, uh, you know, go with the veterans to their healthcare appointments and um, be there and uh, that would be the easiest. Um, unfortunately, a lot of veterans who um, experience homelessness, they might not have their family members active in their life. So the first step is to try to figure out who that fem family member is that would be willing to um, talk with us, uh, us meaning the clinicians, um, and then going from there. But Grant, yeah, so I definitely agree that one of the Hallmarks of reintegration is community reintegration, which is being back with your family and friends. But getting there is not as easy as it sounds. Looks like Sandy Chapman has a question. Thank you so much for such a comprehensive. I'm so excited that there's this many services. I don't think a lot of people know, and we yeah. work with so many veterans. I think as we spoke this last summer, one of the things that we are very interested in is uh, we feel like some of the research we're doing, but also the uh, clinical offerings can help them to be successful during this year of transition and can almost intercept homelessness, you know, both from the stress and depression. What kind of grants? Um, are they through your agency, the VHA, or where, where, how would we work together with you to begin to uh, work on some of this or do some pilot testing. I know we talked about some possibilities of grants, but what what do you see now as you begin to understand more about what we do here at Brain Health and with our dedication to helping homelessness and really keeping vet veterans from getting there? So I do think that it's a perfect partnership with you, um, but we just don't know exactly how to navigate it. Sure, yeah. Um, so thank you for your interest. It's exciting to hear, again, your commitment to it. Um, I would just encourage folks, if they have an idea, to reach out to me and we can uh, go about uh, trying to flush it out. I can say that our fiscal year 21 budget, we've finalized that. Um, but once I know more about the specifics, we can talk further and go from there. Um, a lot of, um, there's other grant opportunities outside of the center. And I would say that um, our center, again, doesn't have that great of a budget, um, but that would then mean that we would be collaborating together and applying, for example, for a, um, you know an HSRMD grant funding um, through the Office of Research and um, Development. But if folks are interested, um, please contact me and we can go from there. Thanks. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sure. Dr. Your, um, presentation. It's great to know that um, all of these dedicated folks are working on this key problem. And uh, thank all of you for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you again soon in another Frontiers uh, talk. Mm -hmm.